All right, so I have learned a lot. I think I told you, um, you know, I, I really hadn't studied Revelation deeply uh, until I started getting ready for this, for this series, right? Even in seminary, it was pretty much a cursory thing. Um, and so uh, what I've realized over the past six or eight months as I've been studying Revelation is this is probably the most Trinitarian book in the Bible. I mean, this book, you cannot escape the Trinitarian nature of God. And I know a lot of people struggle with the Trinitarian nature of God. I know I have in the past struggled with that as well. And the reason is, is because we can't really understand it, right? I mean, um, it would be like, well, how, how is one being really three at the same time, right? It's, I can't really get my mind around that. And if you guys don't struggle with that, Good, I'm glad you don't, but in the past I have struggled with that, and I know some of you I've spoken with and other people have said, well, I can't be a Christian because I'm not, I don't believe that. Um, but I think of it like this, um, it would be like an amoeba trying to understand me, right? I just, God is so much greater than we are, so much beyond our understanding that it's, if we could understand everything about God, it would probably be an argument against God's existence because it would be something that we might make up on our own. So um, the Trinity is, I understand, difficult to, to, to talk about. Um, and I just, I wanted to share with you, and I, I think I've shared this before, how I think of the Trinity, understanding that it's insufficient, right? Understanding that I can't really explain to you the Trinity. But the way I think of it, and it just helps me, is that God the Father is the creator of all and stands outside of time and outside of space, right? He is, yes, the big guy. <laughs> and when God the Father wants to come to earth in person, you know, God with skin on, that's Jesus. Right? When God decides to interact with his creation physically, he comes in the person of Jesus Christ. And when God wants to interact with his creation without skin on, that's the Holy Spirit. So today, when we are feeling the movement of God, we are feeling the movement of the Holy Spirit. Right? That, and again, that just helps me, and if it doesn't help you, let it go. You don't have to hold on to that. But it helps me to think about God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit without getting too caught up into what, what all that really means. Today we're talking, obviously, about the Holy Spirit and um, what he's doing. And, and the, the thing about Revelation that makes it so Trinitarian in nature is that everything the Father is doing, the Son is doing. And everything that the Father and Son are doing, the Holy Spirit is also doing. So we see all three of them working together and at the same time and doing the same thing and in many cases having the same description. And so we can understand a little bit about the Trinity. So as I said, we're going through the big themes of Revelation. And one of the big themes of Revelation is the Holy Spirit and his work on earth, God's work on earth in the person of the Holy Spirit. Um, so that's what we're going to look at. Um, God, or the Spirit, is God in action today and in the book of Revelation. So as we, as we talk about that, um, as we're looking at Revelation, we should say, what are the actions that we see God, or what are the actions that we see the Holy Spirit doing? It's been said that the Holy Spirit is the shyest member of the Godhead, because he never calls attention to himself. He never says, hey, look at me. He's always pointing to Jesus. He's always pointing to God the Father. He never, he never brings attention to himself. And so as we're going through this, we have to read be between the lines a little bit. I mean, some of it's right out there, but some of it's between the lines as we look to see how the, the Holy Spirit is working in Revelation and how he's working in our lives today. All right? So here we go. The first thing that we see the Holy Spirit doing in the book of Revelation is speaking. The Holy Spirit speaks. 
And that's not news, right? And just like two weeks ago, I t- we talked about God the Father, and I said there's no real new information here. Just like last week, we talked about God the Son, and I said, well, you know, this is, this is really good, and we need to remember it, but it's not new information. In the same way today, as we go through this, we're talking about God the Holy Spirit, and there's no real new information. We all knew, I believe, that God the Holy Spirit speaks. But we see that clearly in the book of Revelation. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, we were looking at the message to the churches. And if you remember, over and over and over, there was a phrase repeated. It said, if anyone has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Right? So the Spirit was, was speaking, in this case, through the prophet, through John. John was a prophet. He was bringing the word of God to the churches and to us. And it was the Spirit who was leading him to say what he wanted to, John to say. And so today, in the same way, God, the Holy Spirit, speaks through prophets. Now, prophets are a little bit different, and, and you got to be careful when I say that, right? Because there's a lot of people who will tell you that they have a word from God for you. And I don't know that that's always true. I feel strongly that you should whatever. And we can't really trust that. God doesn't generally speak that way, one person to another person. I'm not saying it's impossible. God can certainly do whatever God wants to do, and I'm not going to tell him not to. But we have to remember, when God speaks through a prophet, it's always lining up with Scripture. God will never tell you to do something that doesn't line up with Scripture. The easiest way to know if it's not from God is if it's something opposed to what Scripture would say. So God sometimes speaks through prophets. And, by the way, this is a prophet. This is the Word of God. And that's what the word prophet means, is speaking forth the Word of God. So as we read the Scriptures, how many of you have read Revelation like I asked you to? Sat down and read it pretty much straight through. Good, excellent. Do you know the, remember the two witnesses? Right? Remember there were the two witnesses and they, they prophesied in the streets of Jerusalem. You remember those guys? Well, I believe those are symbolic rep- representations of the Word of God. They were the, the law and the prophets, and they were speaking the Word. They were speaking God's truth to the people who weren't listening, unfortunately, uh, at that time. But one thing that we see is the Bible is the prophetic Word of God for us today. Now, the second way that the Spirit um, speaks today is through the church, right? We, we are the bride of Christ. In fact, let me just read to you. This is towards the end of the, the book. It's Revelation 22. You don't have to look it up, um, but write it down. So check me later, make sure I'm telling you the truth. Uh, Revelation 22 verse 17 says, the Spirit and the bride say, come. Remember last week we talked about we are the bride of Christ. The Spirit and the Bride, the church, say, come. It's the Spirit speaking through the church. We are to be a vessel for the Spirit to speak to the community, to the people around us who need to hear the Word of God. And what does it say in this passage that we're supposed to be saying? It says, the Spirit and the Bride say, come. Let him who hears say, come. And let him who is thirsty come. We are to be drawing people to Jesus. Let him who is thirsty come. Let him him who desires take the water of life without price. Our, Our purpose as a church is to share the great gospel of the grace of God that salvation is a free gift. We simply offer. Now I say free gift and and we have to remember it's not really free. It's free to us, but it was paid for by the work of Christ on the cross. That's why we can offer it um, in the way we do. And just as a brief aside, we have this disagreement every single year. We have a disagreement about whether or not we should allow donations at our water tent down during our outreach. And I am adamant that we should not allow donations for one reason. Let him who desires take the water of life without price. That is the message that we as a church are trying to to tell people is what we're offering you. Yeah, it's a bottle of water. Who cares? 
But it's symbolic of the grace of God. And you cannot buy the grace of God. It's only available as a gift. And if we don't accept the gift, then we don't accept the grace of God. And that's the picture that we as a church are trying to point out as we're giving water to people who are thirsty. So, so the Spirit speaks through the prophets and the Word, and the Spirit speaks through the church. Um, and of course, the Spirit also speaks to us in our hearts quietly. And I think most of us have experienced that before, where, where we have been praying, and we've been listening, and God has spoken softly and quietly. And that's the Holy Spirit moving in our hearts. Um, that's the, the point of the Centering Prayer Group that meets on Sunday morning, is to spend some time listening to what the Holy Spirit would say. The Holy Spirit speaks today. I'm just worried that too many Christians, and I'm not just talking about us, I'm talking about Christians all over the world, don't listen. We just don't take the time to hear what the Spirit is saying because we don't take time to listen. There's so much going on, so many diversions, so many things that take our attention away that if we don't schedule time to listen to God, we probably won't do it. So let's do that. Let's listen to God. Let's make a, put a schedule, write it in your phone and make it a reminder pop up or something. But we need to listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying. The second thing we see is that the Holy Spirit shelters. We see in verse um, 15 of this chapter, it says, Therefore are they before the throne of God. This is the saints who have come through the great tribulation. And it says, Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night within his temple, and he who sits upon the throne will shelter them with his presence. Right? The Holy Spirit shelters us as we are in his presence. And how does he shelter us? Well, he shelters us, first of all, with his power. Um, his, his glory shelters us and keeps us safe. Um, sounds a little bit funny, um, but just being in the presence of God helps keep us where we ought to be. Um, it, with his guidance, and we talked about to the kids today about seeking wisdom from God. And, and that's a promise in the book of James, that if anyone lacks wisdom, ask, and it will be given. And we can ask God for his guidance, and the Holy Spirit will guide us. Not always in the way that we expect. We don't always even know that we're being guided. But that's an act of faith, to seek God's guidance and trust that promise that we're getting it. And then make up your mind. Do what you think is best or where God is leading you to do. We are sheltered by God's guidance in our life. I remember when my daughter went to Indonesia to be into missions, right? And it's a dangerous part of the world. And there were people at the time who said, why would you let her do that? Why would you let your daughter go to Indonesia? Well, first of all, she was an adult. Nothing I could do about it. But second of all, even if I wanted to do something about it, why would I want to take her out of what God is calling her to do? There is no safer place on earth than in the will of God. And if that means Indonesia, praise God. If that means Burlington, Iowa, even better. <laughs> but the point is, there's no better place to be than where God has guided you. Um, so that's the Holy Spirit speaks, the Holy Spirit shelters, and finally, we see here the Holy Spirit seals, right? And so Mike just read us this passage um, about the sealing of, of 12,000 um, Jews from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. In verse 3, um, in, there's a conversation in heaven. It says, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God upon their foreheads. The Holy Spirit seals us. And that's not, it's not something that we think about that much anymore. But the sealing of God has to do with, first of all, um, identification, right? We are sealed as children of God. It's almost like a brand, right? You brand your cattle and you say, this is my cow. I've never actually done that, but that's how I hear it works. And so, in the same way, we are... We are branded as God's children. We, our behavior shows that brand, um, and we are identified. We remember that we are children of God because we are sealed with the Spirit. And by the way, 
the mark of the beast that we hear so much about is simply a counterfeit of that. It's simply saying the opposite, that people who have the mark of the beast are sealed in the name of the beast as opposed to being sealed in the spirit. We'll talk about that Wednesday night one of these times. But right now we're just talking about the sealing of the spirit and how it's an identity thing and it changes um, who we are. Um, and there's protection in that as well, by the way. Um, a seal is, it says, this is mine, right? This is, so if, if, I'm a, if I'm a thief and I want to steal something and I go up to the something and I see it's sealed with the image of the king, we don't have a king, but you're working with me, right? So would I be likely to seal that thing, to steal the thing that is sealed? No, because I don't want to mess with the king. Right? I, a king's going to come after me if I steal something. And so in the same way, we are protected by the, our identity, by the seal we have as the children of God. And the seal that you have should show in your behavior. Right? You should be different from your friends and your neighbors and your co-workers because you are sealed as a child of the living God. And you know how you know if that's true? If people start watching their language around you. It's true. You know, for me, I'm a pastor, you know, I, so people watch their language around me. I remember going golfing one time with a friend, and uh, he had invited some other people, and we are playing, you know, and we're all doing badly, and these guys start swearing like crazy, and my friend says, hey, there's a pastor, there's a pastor over here, <laughs> pastor on the course, boom, the language was perfect the rest of the day. I don't know how I did that, it was miraculous, but in the same way, if you are showing yourself as identified and sealed with the Holy Spirit, people's language will improve around you. Because your language will improve, I hope. Uh, but that's, that's just, when we are different, people treat us differently, and it has to do with our identification and our sealing in the Spirit. And finally, a, a seal is about certainty. Um, you seal a letter to make sure that that letter gets intact to the person that it's going to. And in the same way, the Holy Spirit seals us to confirm that we will get to our eternal home safely and in the way that God wants us to be. And when I say safely, I don't necessarily mean without trouble, right? The church is full of 2,000 years of martyrs who died or were tortured for their faith. But the, but the point is, they got where God wanted them to go because they were sealed in the Spirit. Ephesians says it this way in chapter 1, verse 13. In him, that is Christ, in him you also who have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and have believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. See, if we have heard the gospel of the grace of God, and we have trusted in that gospel and accepted that free gift that we talked about earlier, then immediately we are sealed by the Spirit of God and guaranteed that he will bring us to our eternal heaven. That's a promise. That's the confidence that we have in God. We are sealed. We cannot escape from his hand. Even if we want to get out too late, we're sealed in. Right? God's love encompasses us, and we are brought to glory, not by our work, but by his, because we have trusted his gospel and his promise. That's the sealing of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we see over and over and over in the book of Revelation. And that's the message that we need to bring to the world, is it's simply a matter of trusting God for what God has said that he's going to do. So we've been discussing this all summer. Can you believe we're halfway done with the series already? We've been discussing the main theme of Revelation is that God is in control. And God is in control of our lives too as we listen to the Holy Spirit and we trust him and we accept his plan and his goals for our life. We can have confidence that we are going where God is calling us to be. Let's spend some time quietly thanking God and praising him for what he is doing as he has sealed us for eternity.